Underwater. That's where I do my work. But one of the most harrowing jobs in my entire experience started 50 feet above the water, when I found myself in a helicopter circling over a sunken ship, which was loaded with deadly explosives. I had to get to that ship the hard way. Getting away from it later was to prove even harder. The job began with a frantic call to the office of Ed Harris, general manager of the Porter Construction Company. Well, here it is. It's called the Mini K, converted freighter used as a floating construction base. Yeah, looks like a good work ship. Yeah, she was. Early this morning, she piled up in a fog bank on Torrey Reef. Right now, she's 60 feet down with her bottom sliced wide open. Torrey Reef, let me see now. Where is that? That's, yeah. uh... Well, it's off the uh, Channel Islands, isn't it? About, uh, oh, 100 miles out? That's right. Yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, right there. Oh, yeah. Of course, by now, the Mini K may have slipped off the reef and broken up completely. That's so, we're too late. If not, she certainly will go the moment the prevailing westerly winds come in this afternoon, the currents change. Once that ship begins to break up, nothing up and down this coast will be safe for weeks, maybe months. Huh? How do you mean? What was she carrying, radioactive stuff? No, 20 cans of nitritol. It's a new form of liquid nitro, tremendously powerful. Once that ship comes apart, and those cans begin to drift and scatter, have you any idea what a nightmare that would be? Each one of those cans is more devastating than a mine a hundred times its size. Yeah, I know. Mr. Nelson, we'll pay the limit. If you fly out there, get down into that hold, set a timer, and make sure that those cans are exploded out there harmlessly before that ship comes apart. I swore I'd never get mixed up with liquid nitro again. The nitrothal is worse. It could explode by itself. Well, I'm still down there. Well, of course, that would uh, take care of your problem for you, wouldn't it? Well, I grant you, Mr. Nelson, it could explode by itself in any one of a dozen ways, but what if it doesn't? That's what I have to think about. A ship with a thousand passengers could hit one of those cans and be ripped apart just like that. Well, that kid playing on the beach could pick one up and blow up 20 people as well as himself. Where's your plane? I started out to the wreck in a helicopter. Harris had been trying to get an amphibian plane to take me out and bring me back, but so far this was the best thing that he had come up with. The big problem was that it wouldn't be able to touch down on the water. We reached Torrey Reef within a half an hour. disturbance in the water where bubbles were still rising from the ship. So I figured that we had the right spot. Surface vessels were giving it a wide berth. There was only one way to get where I was going. 
The impact left me breathless, but I was down safely. The helicopter made another turn and came in with my improvised supply base. I pulled the ripcord, it began to open up. It was a special type of rubber raft with a hooded top and a unique boarding platform. My tanks, weight belt, and other items were all inside. Picked the right spot. The ship lay on a fairly even keel on the reef. How long it would stay that way was anybody's guess. I tied off the raft to the wreck and sent up a marker boy. One vitally important thing to do next, to take the water temperature. Nitrotol is safe when kept below 50 degrees. Over that, anything can happen at the slightest jolt. 56 degrees. The nitrotol was deadly. But I was committed to the job. I began to hunt for the special cabin in which the explosive was carried. swam into the corridor, I caught my breath. In front of me, bobbing against the ceiling, was a can of nitrotol, floating loose. I got my hands on it as quickly as I could. I moved gently down the corridor, taking care not to bump into anything. Thermostat control on the outside wall confirmed that this was the right cabin. I moved inside. There were other explosives in here too, but I knew that they were not as dangerous as nitrotol. There it was, a special rack with a series of sections, one for each of the nitrotol cans, and each one of them capable of blowing everything, including me, to kingdom come at any moment. I tried not to think about it. I carefully restored the one that I'd picked up. Five more were still missing. I closed the rack firmly. 
Deep inside the ship, I had no way of knowing it, but Ed Harris had just received an alarming report. The winds were beginning to pick up sooner than expected. He thought about it carefully, then decided that my mission would have to be cut short. His only contact with me was the helicopter cruising overhead. Buzz down on Nelson the moment he surfaces. Signal to him to paddle clear as fast and as far as he can, whether he's finished or not. No, I haven't yet located an amphibian plane. Just keep circling as long as you possibly can. Out. I was checking the deck when instinct warned me to turn, and just in time. How it had worked its way up through the ventilator without exploding was a real miracle. Don't do Nelson any good by running out of gas and falling into the ocean. Come on in. I had been searching a newly sunken ship for cans of a dangerous explosive, nitrotol, which had floated free in the wreck. Now I had run out of air and surface to change my tanks. The helicopter was gone. I fondly hoped that it was because an amphibian plane was on the way to take me out of there. Amphibian plane. Yes, keep trying, keep trying. With full tanks now, I went below to resume my search. Harris here. Good. How long will it take the amphibian to refuel? Good. No, 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 don't send him up here. Send him directly out to Torrey Reef. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll brief him on the radio. Yes, with an amphibian plane now, there, there'll be a chance. Well, that pilot won't have much time for searching. He'll have to move fast and keep a sharp eye. Right. It took me a long time before I found the next nitrotol can in a very precarious perch. Now there was only one more bomb to go, and luck delivered it to me at just the right time, because even as I found it, I took a breath and ran out of air. I didn't have enough hands to hold both of the bombs and switch on my emergency air supply at the same time.
It happened just outside the cabin. With a heart-sickening crunch, the ship writhed on the reef as the changing current clawed at her. The jolt spilled me, but my only thought was to hold onto those bombs, and somehow I did. Then, under the double pressure of anxiety and failing air, I placed those last two bombs in the rack and closed it firmly. I froze as I heard the rumble beginning again. so short on air that I had no time to rig a detonator to explode the nitrotol. I'd have to make another trip down for that. No amphibian. I was exhausted now. I would have to rest before diving again. I was too tired even to worry about the plane. no more air tanks, so I hyperventilated in order to skin dive down and back to accomplish my mission. I had only one thought, get below, set that timer, then get out. After that, I could worry about being picked up. I had set the timer to allow myself 25 minutes. That seemed ample to let me reach the raft and paddle clear. But the long strain of underwater work had dulled my senses. I hadn't considered how weary I might be. As my mind began to clear, I realized that I should have set the timer for a much longer period. Now there was no interval for the rest that I needed desperately. I picked up the paddle and drove my muscles into action again. When that nitrotol went up, it could blast everything for a quarter of a mile around. I dug water desperately. 
Well, that raft is a bright yellow. You should be able to see it. Yes, I know the tricks that water surface plays on visibility. Well, why don't you try to spot the outline of the ship? That might help. Just keep searching. It seemed as though I had been paddling forever. I looked back. I could still see the marker buoy over the wreck. I was still barely on the outer edge of the explosion area. Tired as I was, I knew that I had paddled much further than that. Then I realized what was happening. The afternoon currents had set in, and I was caught on them. The raft was being carried backwards. It would take every ounce of what little strength I had left just to hold my position, if I could do that much. I was losing the fight. The currents were too powerful. I was being pushed back steadily into the heart of the explosion area. Then I saw the amphibian. Harris had come through. It had banked and was at a steep angle. He had seen me, I thought. I was behind him now. He would never see me. I plunged inside the raft hoping to find something in its equipment that would help. My hand did a very pistol. You're close. You're not kidding. <laughs> Hello there. I'm Lloyd Bridges. Skin diving is fun and adventure for young and old, but it can be dangerous. So know the sport well and don't take any chances. Be with you next week for another exciting sea hunt.
For three days, Hurricane Elsa had slashed at the Florida Keys and whipped the seas into giant 30-foot waves. She had stormed and raged, taking her toll of lives and property ashore and afloat. Among her victims was a test boat belonging to Webb Electronics Corporation. On a calm morning following the passage of the storm, the Electra lay in 40 feet of water. There should have been no one alive aboard her, but in her hold, were two silent divers. They knew exactly where to look for what they wanted. They forced open a locker. From it, they took an intricate electronic device. After placing it in a metal case, they got ready to leave the boat. The two men left the Electra the same way that they had entered her, by a gaping hole in her hull. Suddenly, the second man's air hose caught on a jagged piece of metal. Instead of remaining calm, he panicked. He struggled desperately to free himself. Where's Henrik? It was right behind me! It should have come up first! Something must have happened! The man who had panicked would survive, but his survival almost cost me my life. I was conducting underwater firing tests of a pistol for the Jupiter Arms Corporation. A bullet's range underwater is limited. It cannot be fired with great accuracy. My job was to find out just how effective a pistol could be in close underwater combat. Talk to you. Can you come aboard? I'm Cyrus Webb of Webb Electronics. This is urgent, very urgent. It can't wait. Can you come aboard? Okay. She couldn't have, but she did. Went down like a barrel of cement somewhere in this five-mile area. What do you mean she couldn't have, but she did? 
The Electra had an unsinkable hull, an airspace design that guaranteed she'd rot before she sank. She didn't sink. She was sent down. Well, sunk or sabotaged. She's just a speck down there. I don't see how I could help you out any. You've got to, Nelson. Look now. The Electra was a test boat, testing a guided missile tracker I was developing for the government. It proved out. The government's waiting for me to deliver it now. The very safety of this country may well depend on it. And it was a prototype, the only one there is. I've got to recover it. But searching five square miles of the ocean floor, it's just not possible for one man. I'm not asking you to. This yacht's rigged with radar and a phenometer. I'll locate the electric. You bring me up my piece of equipment. What do you say? OK. In this sleek, fast boat, it didn't take us long to get the search underway. Inside the cabin, the skipper and the technician threw all the weight of the latest scientific equipment into action. Electronic devices probed the ocean bottom and scanned the surface of the water. Sonar, radar, and pathometer reported visually and orally on oscilloscopes, audio oscillators, and video recorders. We've completed the first leg, Mr. Webb. I reverse course. Yes, sir. How far apart are you running these search pads? Well, we're getting a 360-degree search on the surface with a radar. We might pick up some of the electric debris. We're covering the bottom with a pathometer. Keep your eyes peeled in there. We're watching it, sir. Radar contact. Where? 80 degrees, about five miles. Let me take a look. Big for debris. Must be a boat. I'll give it a call. The boat ahead answered that she was fishing. In the meantime, the boat underwater, the sunken Electra, continued to elude us. For the next hour, we continued the search. This is the last leg of the pattern, isn't it? Yes. We don't find her this time. We've missed her. Either that or the electrics in the bottom, somewhere outside of the area. Uh, how about it? See anything? Nothing but that same boat as before. We'll widen the search pattern by a mile. Mr. Webb. Yeah? Isn't that the same boat that your radar picked up before? Wonder what she's lying out there for. Well, she said she was fishing. Fishing? These waters, this time of year? Watch that boat, dead ahead, half a mile. Yes, sir. She's moving off slowly, sir. We'll watch it. Let's hope this is it. Even from this distance, it was easy to identify her. It was the Electra, all right. When I got down to her hull, I was not surprised to find a hole big enough to swim through. But I was surprised when I saw that the metal had been blown outward. Only an explosion from inside could have done it. Webb was apparently right in suspecting sabotage. Inside the hold, I tried to orient myself. Webb had given me a pretty good description of the Electra's layout.
These were the lockers Webb had described to me. The microfinder should be in the one at the far left and on the top. Somebody had already forced the locker open. Somebody had gotten away with a microfinder. I swam back the way that I had entered, searching for some clue to the theft of the electronic device. Perhaps the deck in the vicinity of the explosion might turn up something. What I came upon was the last thing that I expected to find, a torn piece of a diver's air hose. No doubt about it. It was an explosion. There was a hole that big in her hole. Which means that whoever did it beat us to the wreck and to the microfinder. But they couldn't have gone down last night in all that storm. Uh, and there's no film, no slime on this. Could have been in the water for more than a couple of hours. Hey, that boat, the one we sighted, it was in this area. That's right. We had her on our scope right about here. Then that's where the hose came from. A diver from that boat. Where is she now? She's out of sight. Can you get a radar contact? Yeah, she's just over the horizon. Bearing 85 degrees, speed 10 knots. Keep tracking her, but stay out of sight. Right. Let's find out what she's up to. Right. We were taking a chance, and we knew it. Men desperate enough to dynamite a ship were not worried too much about our lives if we got in their way. Our yacht stayed out of sight of the boat that we were following. Our radar antenna was high enough to track her. Our quarry was headed southeast. She seemed to be slowing down. They seem to be heading for that island over there. Let's look at the chart, huh? Captain! Let's see, they seem to be uh, heading for this cove here. Yeah, I'd say so, too. This other cove on the opposite side of the island, Captain. You acquainted with that? Sure. You think you could get in there and uh, not let them see us? I think so. My idea is to go ashore, cut across this isthmus, and find out what they're up to. Right. Get around that, Captain. Yes, sir. Ten minutes later, we had circled around the point of the island. The other boat hadn't seen us, but we were close enough for me to reach it underwater. A 15-minute swim brought me to a point from which I'd be able to see the boat and check my bearings. 
she was no more than 100 yards away. I swam what I judged to be 100 yards and looked up. And there she was. Then I noticed a cave opening just below me. Could there be some connection between it and the boat? Why had the boat stopped right over a cave? I decided to have a look. Come here. Look at that. Looks like a diver. Was there anybody around when we were down below? No. There's no boat around here now. That doesn't mean there's no diver down there. Let's get our gear and take a look. An iron stake with a heavy cord tied to it leading into a tunnel. Had they hidden that microfiner down here? To make sure I'd find my way out, I blazed an underwater trail. I didn't know that finding my way out wouldn't be my only problem. Two men were already between me and the exit. I was no longer in a tunnel, but a cave system, a maze of interconnecting passageways, hardly big enough for me to get through. If the cord that I was following ever broke, I might never get out. This was the narrowest passageway that I'd encountered yet. I marked my trail again.
These two knew that I was in the passageway ahead. They also knew that there was no other exit than this. They got set to take me when I returned. Meanwhile, at the other end of the passageway, I discovered the microfinder. Triumphantly, I grabbed it, not knowing that the men who had hidden it were waiting to take it away from me. I had to put down the microfinder to get through the narrow passageway. That was just what the men were waiting for me to do. That's what they had planned on. I was taken by surprise. Fortunately, the cave was so narrow that only one man at a time could get near me. I put the first attacker out of business by ripping out his mouthpiece. Then I blinded him by pulling off his faceplate. The second man had grabbed the microfinder. I remembered the pistol. My bullet clipped his regulator. The impact and the concussion knocked him off his feet. The first attacker finally groped his way back to his faceplate. Once he could see again, he was able to help his buddy. The two divers started after me again. Worried by my long absence, Webb had decided to come around the point to see if I needed help. When I surfaced, I saw the strange boat speeding away. When my two attackers reached the surface, they found themselves with nowhere to go, except straight into our arms. A quick call to the Coast Guard gathered in the third man, too. I'm Lloyd Bridges. You know, three-fifths of the world is covered by the sea. And how little most of us know about that underwater world. Go below with us again next week, huh? For another thrilling adventure in Sea Hunt.